Okay, so what do we want to discuss today? So as you might know, uh, more than, let's say, two years ago, um, our group that develops uh, operations orchestration decided to launch uh, an open source project. Okay, and the, the unique thing here is that, you know, most of the open source project we hear of were actually built from the bottom up. Right, so someone saw the need for um, a library, a framework, a new technology, and he wrote it as open source from reasons we'll discuss in a minute. But in that case, he was writing it from scratch. So a lot of the dilemmas that we were facing were unrelevant to him. But in our unique situation, we're actually pulling out, extracting pieces of our enterprise code uh, into an open source project, which uh, gives a lot of uh, um, points that needed to be really well tuned and finalized in order to make the whole effort worthwhile. So this is what I want to share with you, some of these aspects. Um, we have definitely learned a lot along the way. As uh, some of you might know, uh, CloudSync has been formally released um, a few months back, and we have a uh, nice traction, and uh, we we have learned a lot, even in that uh, short period of time. We went to different directions, then backtraced and tried something else. So we have overall experience uh, of uh, different things. Um, we won't have enough time to cover everything. There are a lot of aspects in open source that we've learned that are, were new and exciting to us. An hour will not be enough for that. Okay. So what I try to do is actually narrow down um, uh, the scope and uh, talk about the following uh, items only. Uh, I must warn in advance, uh, this is not the first time I'm giving this lecture and an hour will probably not be sufficient even to cover all of them but let's give it a go and see how it goes. Okay, so what are we going to discuss today? So let's take it chronologically, right? Is the life cycle of the project. So first you need to take the decision. Uh, do I want to create an open source project? Why? What would it give me? Uh, how much motivation do I have to do that? Which will actually uh, say how much I want to invest in that and so on. Uh, then once the decision is taken, uh, we'll discuss scoping. Right. Uh, in our case, it's very obvious, right? How much to extract and contribute as open source and how much to keep to ourselves. But you know, this can also be relevant to new open source projects because you'll always have some relationship between the open source and the actual commercial product you're writing, right? Uh, no one pays you money to write uh, open source just, you know, for philanthropic reasons. Uh, so it is important to keep the boundaries right and see just how much you want to put in the open source project and what you want to provide in the, uh, in your commercial product that might be part of that ecosystem of the open source project. So scoping will be the next. And the last uh, thing I hope we'll have time for is positioning. Positioning is very interesting because it's actually it doesn't happen as an afterthought to the development of the open source project, right? It's also uh, as part of the planning because you need to understand where you want to position that in the market. And it doesn't necessarily address the same target audience, doesn't necessarily solve the same problem as your commercial product. So it's kind of interesting to create a healthy relationship between those two. So just to recap, to make sure we are all aligned, so what does it actually mean to a, an open source software? What, what are the aspects that are involved? So there are three aspects, and it's very important to understand that only when three of them are present, you can say this is a real open source software, okay? And we'll see in a minute why. Okay, so first and the most obvious, the code is public, right? Um, surprisingly, this is not enough because if I decide I wrote a very cool class and I want to share it with everyone, uh, I can put it a, in a blog post, I can put it on GitHub. Uh, yes, you probably will be able to copy paste it, but if you are going to use it in a commercial product, this will be illegal because actually the copyright of what I'm writing is mine. And the only way under which you can distribute it and make money out of it is if I've attached a license saying what is permitted for distribution. Okay, so the fact that the code is public doesn't make it open source. So it does need to have a, a license that allows for a, um, 
distribution as part of other commercial product. And uh, keep note, it's a whole uh, a world by itself, okay, the whole uh, world of uh, licensing in open source. But mainly there are two families of open source uh, licenses. Uh, they are nicknamed uh, copyright and copyleft. And copyright is what you imagine and vision when you think about open source, right? Like Apache 2 license and stuff like that. You can practically do everything you want with it. Okay, like you can take my uh, GitHub repository, fork it, make some changes, tell the world I've done it better, use mine. I will not be able to, to sue you. Uh, you are free to do that if you wish. And the family of copyleft puts a lot of restrictions. You cannot... Uh, Mostly you cannot uh, distribute it in a commercial product and so on. So you need to have the, the right type of license to make it real open source. And the third thing that people sometimes overlook is actually a thriving community. Because let's say I've put my code in GitHub and I've uh, declared that it's under the Apache 2 license, which is very permissive, as we said. Uh, but uh, I don't get any contributions. I don't allow you to open issues. Um, I don't communicate anything. I just, you know, update the code and that's it. This is not a real open source project, okay? I'm sure there are lots of such projects, but this is no, not what you should aim for uh, um, when you are discussing open source because actually, as we'll see in a minute, you lose all the benefits of having an open source project. So there's really no, not much use in, um, in having an open source without a community. So community is a vital aspect of an open source project. Okay, so now that we know the three um, aspects of uh, open source, let's go to the question that we want to address, which is actually why to open source. Okay, um, why to open source is a question that at least uh, my group did not encounter before, right? It's the first uh, open source project uh, we've created. So we tried to think of it uh, using a question that we do know how to answer. Okay, and that question is why are we actually using open source projects today? Okay, all of our projects, it's very popular. Uh, we're leveraging existing libraries. Some commercial, most of them are not. Most of them are open source. And um, let's see why we're actually doing that. Uh, and then we'll use this information to see if we can, it, if it will help us make a decision uh, of whether to expose our code as open source. So first and foremost, obviously, why are we using open source? Because it's free, right? It's a very important consideration. But it's not enough, right? Uh, we know that a lot of the times uh, we choose open source um, libraries uh, in purpose, not just because we're cheap, <laughs> but also because we want to leverage the wisdom of the crowd. Uh, this actually means that if this is a popular open source project, let's say, I don't know, Log4j, okay, Hibernate, Spring, whatever. Tons of people are using it. So many pairs of eyes have reviewed the code. Uh, so many tests have been running with these libraries, right? So many issues were reported, a lot of discussions, negotiations. People are passionate about these libraries because they use it, you know, as a vital part of their uh, applications that actually pay their salaries. So that wisdom of the crowd actually brought these libraries to a higher level of uh, maturity, uh, quality, security, and so on. We've seen uh, cases in the past where uh, security vulnerabilities were uh, made public, right? And then you finally suddenly discover that some very prominent uh, uh, commercial products were actually affected by these. And then you read between the lines and see that they've known that for years, but they just didn't feel the need to share it with anyone because, you know, the code was theirs and they are the only ones who saw it. And so they thought that they should not invest in, in fixing it because who will know? And, and now you see that actually uh, it's ex exposed and it's a big problem. In open source project, it will only be overlooked if you know um, it's very hard to find. Uh, most projects will find these vulnerabilities and fix them or at least report them early on. So at least you know what you're getting which, when you're taking an open source uh, project, you know, with all the open bugs and open issues. 
So that's another aspect. Also, you have visibility into the code. So you can open the source files, right? And debug sometimes when you're having problems. It's much faster than waiting for the support on your commercial product that will get back to you in 48 hours. And you'll get into tier one, tier two, tier three, and until someone who actually knows what's in the code will be able to help you. So it's very, very easy uh, when you have visibility into the code. And another thing is that sometimes you take um, an open source uh, library and you say, I know it's not perfect. I know it only serves like 80% of what I, I need functionally wise, but hey, I will never find one that um, provides it 100%. And I will invest the effort in contributing that specific thing that I'm missing back to the open source uh, itself. And why would I do that? Why would I contribute it? Because I want the next time that I'm upgrading this library, I want to have this feature, right? I do not want to reapply my fix or my enhancement every time I refresh the library. So uh, a lot of people are doing it. I know I've been doing that and it makes a lot of sense, right? And since the feature I want to add is not unique to me, but maybe is is not you know one of the vital needs but it does add functionality then those who are managing the open source project will be very happy to accept it and uh, as long as it doesn't breach security and is well tested and everything like that then it will be included so um i will get the library that i really need right at the end Okay, so now that we've seen these aspects of usage of open source projects, let's see if we can find the parallel when we want to publish and contribute our code as open source software. So there is like the mirror side for each one of these uh, aspects. So free actually is something that's a bit uh, dangerous, right? Uh, we know that we need to keep motivation to purchase our commercial product. Right, especially in our case, we're extracting abilities from the commercial product. We still want people to to have motivation to purchase um, the commercial uh, version. Otherwise, no one will pay us money to uh, develop the open source one. Uh, when we look at the wisdom of the crowd that we get from open source, we know that it will actually strengthen our technology, right? More people will find bugs, more people will raise uh, productive ideas, uh, more people will, will uh, um, look at the code and alert us if something is not wrong, and uh, it will make actually our technology uh, much better. Visibility into the code um, can be problematic, right? Uh, if you have good, uh, well-written uh, piece of code uh, that is uh, modern and written uh, with uh, good uh, um, design patterns and, uh, you know, is presentable, then you will gain credibility, right? When someone looks at your code, those people might say, hey, this is a very nice piece of code. Uh, now I trust uh, those OO guys that they know how to write their code and I have better confidence in whatever they're writing, including the commercial product. And it can be reverse, right? Someone can look and say, oh my God, this is how they write their code. In that case, I don't want to do anything neither with their open source offering nor with their commercial product. And uh, that is actually uh, why we've done two things. Once we've looked very carefully at our code to make sure that whatever we extract is presentable and nice and clean, okay? And also don't forget that it's very hard to do that with a legacy piece of code. And since our O is relatively new, uh, it was much easier for us, but it definitely is a big consideration when you're open sourcing. And the last thing we have here on the slide is since people want to use open source projects because they have ability to contribute what they care about, then we know that an active community actually contributes back. And that also relates to the aspect of we need to invest a lot of time to accept these contributions. We don't get it really for free, right? And we need to invest a lot in that because this is actually the, the biggest power of the community that we get. Just imagine that HP will now have uh, tens, hundreds, hopefully <laughs> thousands and more of people who are excited about this library and are sitting without being paid by HP and write lines of codes for us. This is a, 
like you know an amazing thing uh, uh, to drive uh, the project further okay so let's see more considerations um, we know that uh, having a good uh, open source uh, related to the business that we're running actually uh, helps us build a thought leadership for our product, for HP in general, right? So even, you know, the, the um, PR effect is very positive. Uh, in arenas when there are no de facto standards, like in our case of OO, uh, for a, a process-based orchestration, there are no de facto standards uh, uh, for uh, authoring flows. So it is a, a great opportunity for us to set the de facto standards. And we can do that if we make sure that um, the that CloudSlang is pervasive, that many people use it and start, you know, using this as something they're familiar with. Uh, just a nice anecdote, as some of you might know, uh, same thing happened to Hibernate, right? So Hibernate um, was fighting head to head with uh, uh, EJB2 uh, 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 from uh, at that time uh, Sun, and uh, people hated EJB2. And people really didn't want to use that. And a lot of people started to use Hibernate. And uh, when I started to use Hibernate, I know that management was very scared that it has no standard. Uh, what will happen if Hibernate will go away and we'll need to rewrite the whole code because no, uh, no other vendor actually supports their interface and people were concerned. And then uh, when EGB3 uh, was uh, created, then actually um, most of the committee members uh, that defied this uh, JC, um, this standard were from Hibernate. And it's like one to one, same as Hibernate, only, you know, every word was replaced by another word, but there are two exactly equivalent uh, standards in the uh, DSLs. So de facto standards do have a great impact on the industry. So I hope uh, one day we can tell the same success story about uh, CloudSlang. Um, another thing that is very important is that you actually create a community of technical SMEs. What do we mean by that? Today, when we want to sell OO, we come to a customer and tell him, you know, there are no de facto standards. So we have our own proprietary language for writing flows in a OO. And uh, that customer might come and say, but it's going to be very hard for me to find a good uh, experienced people in OO authoring because actually it's not a standard. How am I going to recruit such people? I will need to teach them how to do that. It will take time. But now if we go and tell him, you know CloudSlang DSL, you can author the same way on OO, and he will say, oh, now it's very easy for me to get authors to write in OO, so yeah, OO now becomes much more attractive compared to its uh, competitors, okay? Um, another thing is that uh, open source software is always an excellent channel to dev audience. Okay, uh, we can see it in CloudSlang even today, and uh, it actually uh, comes to serve the need of dev people to consume um, our commercial products as well. And this is like a, you know a, a foot in the door for having such engagements. And, uh, okay, this is just, you know, an important point, but not relevant to OO because this is not the model we uh, decided to adopt, but, you know, anything can change. Uh, in case the business model is actually based on support and training, right? So take uh, Red Hat, for instance. Red Hat's policy is that they contribute to many, many open source projects. They lead a lot of open source projects. How do they get money? They say, we can give you support and training for all these open source projects. We are very qualified, right? We are the core uh, leaders of the projects or core contributors to these projects. So you can trust us. And this is how they make money. Uh, so, you know, if you want to have um, a, a go with the open source, uh, uh, with creating an open source project, this is a very reasonable channel that you can uh, uh, that you can examine. Okay, so let's talk about scoping, and this is very interesting. Uh, let's use a very simplified uh, model here. Let's say that my commercial product uh, is composed of three modules, okay? And um, uh, let's say it's a layered architecture, so module two depends on two, uh, three on two and two on one. And now I, I'm starting to think what should I contribute and what, what should 
what should I hold back? So there are, let's say, um, two uh, rough models uh, to handle that, okay? So one model will say, give everything, okay? Give the entire uh, set of capabilities, of functional capabilities that your product uh, is able to handle, but hold back enterprise readiness. As you can see, I've made it like dotted. So actually you have all three modules, but all three modules behave a bit differently. Let's give an example. Uh, I'm giving OO as is with everything, reporting, execution, um, uh, user management, okay? All the full uh, set of uh, abilities, but I do not support high availability, okay? As an example. Uh, so this is one uh, approach. Another approach, would say, okay, take the code, give away uh, core modules, but hold back the extended functionality, okay? So in this case, we do not give a uh, module three. This is available only the commercial offering, uh, but I give module one and module two fully, okay? Exactly the same uh, pieces of code. So let's discuss the pros and cons of uh, each uh, approach. So if I'm giving away the whole code base, then, but I want to hold back some abilities, then obviously I'll need to extract those, this high availability um, a feature from the code, right? And in my commercial product, inject it in runtime in some way, like dependency injection and so on, okay? So I'm actually, the more I hold back, the more I have to litter my code with those points of injection, right? So I need to go and really modify the code and put things aside and make sure they're only uh, uh, injected in runtime. It's kind of ugly, okay? That's one. The, the more important thing will be that, let's say my, my project is very successful. It's get, it gets a lot of traction. People are very excited about it. Uh, they want to use it. And when they start using it in uh, enterprise environments, uh, they face the problem of no high availability. Okay, but as we said, people take open source projects, even if they're not 100% perfect, right? Uh, they say, it's perfectly fine. I will contribute what I care about. And then uh, someone decides that uh, he really loves it and high availability is very important to him. And he's taking the effort to sit down and implement high availability for that project, right? And now he's contributing it to, the, um, to my repository, right? And now I'm, as the moderator of this project, need to take a very, very problematic decision. First option, to deny his contribution. It's done by the rules, by all the best practices, tested, provides additional uh, functionality that people in the community really want. I can't really reject it, right? Um, if I will reject it, they might do something similar that uh, people did, did to Jenkins, right? Which started as Hudson. Um, people did not like the way the community was, was handled. They forked it, renamed it as uh, Jenkins. And now community has full control and puts everything they want in the, in the product, in the project, more accurately. So I don't want to, to do that, right? It's a democracy, an open source project. I cannot really be a, a tyrant saying, you can do everything but high availability. High availability is mine. So that's one, one uh, choice I have, which obviously I'm not going to take. Another uh, approach to, to treat this contribution is to say, okay, you know what? You've donated the high availability code. It's fine. It's written well. I I'll merge it into my, um, my code base, uh, into the open source code base. And now I, with my commercial product, I have a problem. Which high availability mechanism do I rely on? Do I rely on mine or do I rely on the communities? Uh, mine is better, maybe only for the short term, but they will catch up, you know, and theirs will be better. So what's the point in investing in two? And more importantly, why would people buy my commercial product if now this provides all the missing functional ability, enterprise ready ability, abilities that were missing? So now we risk cannibalism, right? My own product is going to eat up my commercial product. So this is not a very good approach. Uh, let's look at the right side approach. Right side approach actually doesn't make me uh, work too hard on the code, 
right? Because if my code is modular to begin with, then it should be very easy to contribute only module one and module two in Quebec module three. Uh, it still makes sense because, you know, I'm contributing the lower levels and not the higher levels, meaning no dependency is missing here. Those two models provide a full functionality, uh, doesn't maybe provide, you know, higher level functionalities. Uh, we can take Ansible as an example. You can take Ansible open source for free. It does whatever you want it to do. Uh, once you need reporting, you'll need Ansible Tower, which is uh, commercial and you need to pay for a license. Okay? People don't feel cheated when they take only Ansible. They say it's perfectly fine. When we need reporting, we either pay for Ansible Tower or we create our own uh, a supplement module, either open source or proprietary, whatever, that creates reporting on top of the Ansible engine, right? Um, from Ansible point of view, I might be competing with the Ansible Tower, but first, they're way ahead of me, right? Um, it will take me a lot of time to catch up, and when I invest that time, they will advance as well, right? So they can keep a gap. Uh, second, they get a lot of credibility from the community for the parts they've donated, right? So people will prefer paying them money rather than paying me, unless it's much cheaper, I don't know. And the third thing is that if I publish that I've created a reporting tool over Ansible, it actually strengthens their technology because now they have an ecosystem. Uh, around the uh, open source project, which, give, which gives a lot of credibility to an open source project, right? And I'm giving them actually positive PR and buzz and so on. So they gain a lot of momentum by what I'm doing. So actually, no one is going to be angry with me for uh, creating my own alternative for that missing uh, module. Um, what else we can say? Okay, uh, we said that uh, it's best to expose only, you know, the nice code, uh, the code that you're proud of. So this is al also very well because I can beautify only module one and module two, and I don't need to do that for the modules I'm keeping back, right? While in the original approach, I need to beautify my whole code base. So also gives me more flexibility and maybe, you know, gradually release first module one and only later module two and so on. Um, okay, so I guess you are convinced, and if not, <laughs> please unmute and, and express your concern. Uh, but uh, I think it clearly speaks for itself that the modular approach is much better than the um, holdback uh, enterprise readiness or other uh, features approach. Okay. Um, so now that we've seen that in a very simplified example, let's examine our use case to get a better understanding of what it actually involves. It's not as simple as I have described it now, obviously. Okay, so all of you know OO. Uh, for those who don't, I will sh say it very shortly. Uh, OO is actually an enterprise uh, product uh, reaching for, you know, the... Uh, companies who uh, care about uh, security and uh, uh, resilience and everything, so a lot of enterprise uh, features. Uh, it's used for um, um, IT automation, okay? Uh, it can run uh, run books and uh, flows that are defined by uh, authors in the product, and then we have a runtime environment in which they can run. And uh, we have a lot of uh, management on top of this execution of the flow, um, reporting, managing uh, the different flows, we call that content, uh, managing the content that we want to deploy into OO, reporting, uh, monitoring runs, and so on. Okay, um, just a, a diagram to help you see the layers um, in the OO perspective. So we have three parts. A studio is where you author the flows. It's not very important for this uh, for this phase of uh, the discussion. Then we have the runtime environment, which are the central and the RAS instances. And in the central and RAS instances, what you can see is that we have actually uh, the engine itself that does the execution of the flows. 
Okay, and if we look at central, you see that there are additional layers on top that provide more and more and more capabilities. Okay, uh, but uh, they can be treated as additional uh, capabilities on top of the very basic capability of execution of workflows. Okay, so this is actually what we have decided to contribute and all the blue things is are the things that we're holding back. So you can see that there is still very strong motivation to purchase OO on the one hand. And on the other hand, the gap is big enough so that any competitor that wants to leverage Cloud Slang because he says, uh, I'm taking it and half of my job is complete because I already have the engine. Now all I have remaining is to have the reporting, the management, uh, the content and so on, actually has a lot of work set ahead of him. Right, and it will take them a lot of time to catch up with us, which can be actually infinite because we're opening the gap uh, right as we go. So we feel very safe by doing that. Someone once asked me when I give this lecture, um, but in the worst case scenario, uh, a competitor of yours can take Cloud Slang and actually have a better orchestration engine than he has today, and now he's a stronger competitor. And then I said, this is not scary at all, because then we can say, you see, even our competitors are leveraging cloud slang because they trust our technology and therefore trust us to develop a good and solid technology. So you as customers should trust us more as well. So this is actually a very big vote of confidence by our competitors, if that will happen. So this is actually a dream that we have. It's not uh, something that scares us. Okay, so now we've seen how we actually uh, um, implement that layered uh, contribution approach uh, to our own cloud slang. And now uh, let's talk about what uh, relationship you want to have between OO and cloud slang. Okay, because that's another aspect. We don't want to have two code bases for the orchestration engine, right? It doesn't make sense. It's a big overhead. Uh, we're telling the community we are not using it, but we, we tell you that it's worthwhile for you to use it, right? It doesn't make sense. So, uh, in the uh, very naive uh, format, we could have said that we're cons consuming cloud slang la just like any other third party we're consuming, right? So, for instance, every release that we have in OO, we refresh, uh, let's say, Spring and Hibernate and uh, Tomcat. Okay, and uh, then parallels, we we testing with that and see that uh, everything works well together and we're obviously relying on those uh, frameworks. But we want to do things differently with, with Cloud Slang. We don't want to consume it uh, per release, right? Or maybe even, I don't know, once a month or something like that, uh, because we're, we want to show that we're uh, trusting Cloud Slang and that we have a business investment in Cloud Slang. And that's why we actually take every successful nightly build um, into a row. Okay, so uh, we're actually continuously uh, consuming cloud slang, okay? And that's why we're actually not only drinking our own Merlot, but we're drinking it on a daily basis, which also brings additional confidence to the contributions that we make to cloud slang, right? It's not only covered by the set of tests that we have in cloud slang that are visible to the whole community, but we have one consumer, an enterprise consumer, that consume it, consumes it has a very large set of tests and system tests, right, to cover it. And we can get a lot of confidence every day with the contributions that were made, made in the past day. So this is uh, also coming to assure the community that they have even a broader coverage on the, the code than what they just see in the GitHub. Okay, so um, again, uh, we discussed a very naive model, right? We give two modules, we hold one back. In our case, the numbers are a bit different, but I was ignoring a very important part, okay? Because um, the language that you use to create a OO flows, uh, some of you know, is very different from the way you author cloud slang flows. And the question is why? 
So here in the slide, you can see a very simple flow, the way it looks in OO, okay? OO um, is targeting the IT operation guys. They're usually not technical guys. Uh, they're not used to writing source codes. Um, max, they're writing scripts now and then. And uh, they feel very comfortable in dragging and dropping and wiring uh, those boxes on the canvas and, and they can express uh, their business needs um, via this uh, flow. And now the question is, do we want to include that language also as a module of what we're exposing to uh, the open source community or do we want to hold it back? And that's actually leading to another more important question of how we want to position cloud slang in the market. Because if we are saying that maybe we're not addressing the same target audience, then maybe this method of drag and wire on a canvas using those nice colorful boxes is not what our customers will actually need, like, or even want, right? So, here we have a big question, and to answer what we actually do with the DSL, the domain-specific language, right, uh, leads us to the positioning discussion. I'll do it very shortly because we don't have much time. So let's put it that way. Whenever we want to uh, uh, position a new product, we need to think mainly about two aspects, okay? It's very simplistic. Uh, when we've done this, uh, we, we've we used uh, people from the Inno team uh, that have experience with Lean Canvas, uh, which is a methodology for, let's say, mainly startups in their early stages that want to be very, very focused and you know uh, ramp up very quickly uh, with their exposure to the market. And there's a very nice uh, technique and process of how to do this. What to think about, you know, even how to, to write it down, how to um, uh, annotate it, and so on. So this is kind of simplistic, okay, of Flynn Canvas. So the two main things we need to define uh, is who our target audience is and what problems they have who want to target. So at the end of a very long process, and we're still refining it, okay? Uh, Lean Canvas is iterative. Uh, we've defined the following. We want to address developers and DevOps, okay? But those people have skill set that is very different from the IT ops guys I've been mentioning. Uh, these people like, you know, uh, scripting and um, uh, they want to declare their flows, not to draw it. They don't like fancy UI. They don't like colorful boxes and so on. And the problems that we want to save is actually day two operations on DevOps environments. And here's an interesting point. Uh, they have other very problematic problems, okay? Why did we choose that one specifically? We saw that in the market of day one, day one is when you actually set up your environment. In this case, your Dev DevOps environment, okay? So there are a lot of tools that can answer that need, right? You can use Ansible, Randex, Sol. Salt stack, uh, you can use, right, a uh, chef, puppet, whatever, uh, which can help you solve that problem kind of easily. Uh, they're using um, topology based orchestration, which means that you just define what machines and relationships of applications and components you want to end up with, and you just say go, and they do whatever is required to get to that end state. So it's very intuitive and, you know, they are very popular tools. Uh, our uh, technology, which is process orchestration, uh, is shining in other use cases. Those use cases in, is where you do not uh, define the end state, but rather the process of what you want to do, right? It's like an algorithm. You're saying, try that, and if it succeeds, do that. Otherwise, do something else and then test that. And then you might want to open a ticket, but then you might want to send an email before you do the other thing and so on. So it's not just the where I want to get to, but also how do I want to get there. And this method is much more usable in... It, not that it's much more usable in day two, it can also handle uh, day one use cases, but it really shines in day two use cases of monitoring, uh, fixing, right, remediating problems, um, scaling up, scaling down, stuff like that. It's very hard to do that with uh, existing tools. 
uh, especially open source tools that exist today. So we saw an opportunity with this problem that uh, uh, we'll be able to excel uh, in that specific problem. Okay, so we took the combination of these two definitions. And also there is a notion that you need to define your early adopters because you know uh, you need to get momentum with your project. So even though you say we can help all DevOps people, but we said let's first solve problems that are related to Docker users because Docker is uh, very new, not many tools, uh, a lot of buzz. Uh, we feel that it will be a good, uh, you know, a, a engine to pull us uh, to pull us um, uh, fast forward. Uh, so we've defined also the early adopters um, uh, community. And those two actually leads to the technologies that you use and the use case that you want to solve, right? So as I said earlier, these people do not want to have uh, boxes and arrows uh, on their canvas. They want something that looks like that. It's kind of small, but you don't really need to read it. Um, the point is that the DSL that we've chose um, is oriented to dev guys, right, and not to ops guys. And also technologies, right? Uh, we could say um, it's declarative, but uh, I don't know. Uh, we need a, a specific language because we're describing a solution for some problem. And now that we've well defined the problem, the DSL is much more obvious, right? Because we want to have them define a process. Uh, so I'll just go very quickly over the benefits of our DSL. So we know it's dev oriented because it's YAML based and YAML is very popular. Uh, we know that uh, it's very easy to write with this DSL because it favors conventions over exceptions, right? Meaning that uh, most of the time you don't need to define your, what you want to do. We can, we have very good defaults and only in case the default is not what you need, then you will explicitly say that you want to do something else. Uh, we create a lot of DevOps uh, flow for a showcase, right? Because a lot of the power of it is content, just like it is for OO. Uh, Ready-made Docker building blocks, because as we said, uh, these are the early adopters that we are targeting. Okay. Okay, so that's how we actually define the DSL. And now comes a very interesting point. Uh, I told you earlier that we are maintaining a single code base and everything is perfect and uh, every investment we make into CloudSlang actually pays back to OO, right? Because OO is consuming the engine. And now I'm telling you that we need to invest in a new DSL that doesn't seem to serve OO at all, right? And does is it worthwhile to invest in the DSL just because you know the open source is targeting another uh, target audience and the exciting answer is that actually it brings value back to OO because now OO is actually able to execute a, a YAML DSL right DSL based on YAML that is very de uh, dev oriented and brings those target audience that target audience into OO as well. So we see that even that investment that was kind of not driven by OO requirements at the time is actually paying back also into OO and help it uh, expand the exposure that OO can have. And we know that we have already today customers of OO that told us if you didn't have an open source uh, declarative solution to allow us to create flows that can be then ported into OO and executed in the central IT environment when you have, you know, a enterprise ready requirements and everything, we would have gone and looked for competitors that provide that because this is the direction the world is uh, aiming for. Okay, IT um, doesn't see open source as a threat, but actually as an advantage to attract line of business and, and other uh, aspects. So actually it became a very big advantage uh, for OO. Okay, so now OO actually supports uh, both the uh, um, uh, existing DSL, the FL uh, wiring uh, of uh, visual components and uh, CloudSling uh, YAML based DSL. 